big pleasure for us to welcome our new colleague from Maxo and our colleague from here. Because here. And um, it's, um, it's a very a big jump start for our collaboration because we know each other very well from the last two decades where we have had uh, good collaborations uh, with ma many of the people in Rostock and this is for sure to be continued. So we are well prepared to receive our new colleagues. We know each other's way of looking at the scientific problem, the, the, uh, and in this case, the, the aging challenges, which is based on a success that we are alive. And, and uh, of course, we have differences in language. I don't know if you noticed that Jim talks about the chance of death which to a medical doctor don't sound real right. We, we prefer risk of death. That's uh, 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 the chance that the patient dies don't really uh, 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 make it uh, very well. So, but these are all minor differences because where we really come into and, and have a, a, a nice uh, uh, collaboration is that while the de demography for a long time can... Uh, provide us uh, with important information on the mortality and the birth and so on. Of course, what from a public health and a medical point of view is a key question is that are we not only living longer, but are we also living better? Because nobody has concern about the babies that we save. Very few people have concerns about all the activities and action that are taken among middle-aged and younger elderly people. Very few people doubt that we are doing good there. What is the real concern is, what about these very old people, people in the 80s and the 90s, more than 100? Why are we doing this, as some people say? Is it just because we want a better view from middle in life, that when you're in your 50s, it's nicer, that Jim tells you that the life expectancy is up in the 80s, 90s, 100, it's a better view. But that the people who are out there is not actually very happy and the society is not very happy, that maybe we're only carrying through the very weak people to get this better view in middle life. This is a very legitimate concern, and we should study this very carefully. And therefore, uh, these, some people have, have term, uh, call it a failure of success. The success is that people live a long time, but the failure is that they're not very happy, and the society is not very happy. And I think actually it was Baldus that was mentioned previously that termed the coin the fourth age, that this was before we have childhood, adulthood, and old age, and now we were putting on this fourth stage that was not actually any success. So to get more data on this, because this has not been studied very much large scale, we in 1998 uh, ring the doorbell of everybody who was born in 1905 and living in Denmark. That was about 3,000 people. And two-thirds of them invited us in, and we made a medical, small medical examination, and then we followed these people every two, three years until they turn 100. Then you might say, okay, you start studying these people when they're 92, 93. They're already very old. They already made it to very high ages. But when we're talking centenarians, they're... they're they're pretty young. They are, when you're 92, you're only halfway to 100. Might not sound right, so I'll back it up with some data. So for a woman born in 1905, the chance that she'll make it to 92 is actually 10%. But then it's only again 10% that she'll make it from 92 to 100. For males, the corresponding numbers is 1 in 30. We'll come back to that. Some of us is a little bit worried about that. So, so uh, but what we found was very surprising. And uh, our clinical colleagues were very skeptical about this because we could show that here we plot the proportion who are independent. They are physically and cognitively well-functioning. And when we visit them the first time, there was about a third of them who were very well functioning physically and cognitive. When we come back two years later, it was the same proportion. And when we came, when they were 98 and 100, it was the third. Then our clinical colleague would say, no way. When you're in your 90s, you're, you're, you're declining in terms of functioning. They're right, 
and we are right. Because if you notice, in two years, about half the population die. And those who die are those worst functioning. So if we plot where these people who end up out here came from, they actually came up here. So here we see this balance between everybody is kind of declining, but those who's doing worst is dying out. So on an average, it's stable. So it's basically, it's good news for populations. 100 years old are not more demanding than 92 years old. So we don't have to worry about this aspect. The bad side, it's not good news for individuals. It's not like if you make it to 92, you're home safe, no, nothing's going to happen. So, so, uh, but on a population level, this is real good news. Then, of course, the next argument could be, OK, that's fine, you did it OK with the 1905 cohort, but for sure, thing has been moving on since they were at a certain age. Because for every 10 years, we here in Denmark, about 30 to 40 percent more make it into their 90s compared to 10 years previously. So we might be okay at this point in time, but now with the 1915 cohort, we carry many more. So maybe now we are making more bad than good, and that's actually what we're trying to get at here. We should, at, the, at the end of the day, we should do more good than bad in these ages. And therefore, we have put a lot of effort in at the Danish Aging Research Center to study uh, cohorts born 10 years apart at very high ages to see if those later cohorts that are much bigger, are they on average better, the same or worse? And up to now, it looks good. There's more of them, they are functioning better, especially cognitively, but also physically in the daily life. When we measure their muscle, they're not stronger. But the better head and the better living condition for elderly people make the activity of daily living better. And for sure, also the medical system. In my uh, rather short career as a medical doctor, which is 25 years ago, there was a number of eight limits for various treatments that you could go in and look. If you over that eight, you couldn't get it in the public uh, health system here. This has disappeared. And for sure, some of these changes has been dramatically. We looked at hip replacement among elderly people. And we compared the 1895 cohort with the 1905 cohort. This is the percentage of the birth cohort getting it at various ages, late 80s, early 90s, late 90s, and then depending on uh, age at death. So this is for the whole cohort in Denmark from these years. And you can see that in those born in 1895, they didn't get any hip replacement when they were in the late uh, 80s. And 10 years later, a lot of people in the late 80s got hip replacement. That's not very surprising. That is just that policies are changing. We are giving hip replacement to elderly people. But the, the development has been so dramatic that you see really strange things within a cohort, as you can see here. Because you can see these people born in 19, 1895. When they were in the late 80s, they were told they were too old to get a hip replacement. Then look, when they got into their 90s, they became young enough to get a hip replacement. <laughs> and when they get you know, close to 100, no problem. You know. So, so you can see this dramatic change in the attitude to treatment of elderly people. With this attitude, it can also fair to say be better techniques, anesthesia, and so on. But we are doing a much better job in treating elderly people now. So that looks good. There's one worry thing that I'll finish off with, and that is, uh, for some of us, it looks much better than other. Um, I'm often asked the question, you study this to become 100 year, what should you do? First of all, the first answer is, be a woman. That's not much you can do about it, but it's really dramatic, because behind the very nice graph Jim showed with this development in the number of centenarians, beneath it, there's this two uh, sex-specific curves. So it's not hard to see which team you want to be on. So, and it's not only in Denmark. You can find your country here, maybe. And it's the same in the US. Germany is out here. 
And so it's a very, very fixed pattern. And one of the reasons why we study this in the Danish Aiding Research Center is that it doesn't really make any sense biologically. Because when we do our surveys, like the 1905, we visit people every two, three years. The pattern is that females have a lot of diseases. They have a lot of complaints. They go a lot to the doctor. Things are not going very well. When we come back two years later, same picture. The guys, they're doing pretty okay. No problem, doing fine. Only problem is that they're dead next time we come. <laughs> so, so, uh, so apart from that, they're doing real good. And then, then one option is, of course, that male is out of contact with their body. They don't know what they're talking about. They've never been used to it. So we might better measure it. And therefore, one thing that works really well is muscle strength. It predicts disability, survival. It's a very good health indicator. And it's very reliable and easily measured. And in our surveys, we can plot this from age 50 to 90, and you can see both for males and females, there's this that you lose about half your strength from age 50 to 90. And it works beautifully as a predictor of health, both within males and females. But look, if you want to compare across sex, and if you want to make a fair arm wrestling competition between, uh, say, a woman in her late 40s, then you have to get an 80-year-old male, right? So 80-year-old males are as strong as 45-year-old females in a, in a characteristic that predicts survival. And females have to do all the hard stuff, giving birth, going into menopause, having all these diseases, and they keep on living. For males, nothing happens really after age 18, except for slight decline. So, <laughs> so, so this is one of the things that we will really like to look into also. So to wrap up, I think that we are very excited about this combination uh, welcoming our Maxo colleagues because here we have something that is very important to demographers, namely very, very reliable social and health registers and social register. We have all these surveys conducted over the last 20 years and we have an international interdisciplinary collaboration and we know each other well for many years and have a already a jump start on the collaboration. Thank you. Thank you.